Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, we continue with this session and now we move over to multitasking and time sharing. Uh, it's a general life, you know, and we, most of us are involved in multitasking in various situations. A, a driver, uh, the housewife, take anybody. There are different tasks which individuals do at the same time or one after the other. And does it have any implication for the speed with the, the task will be performed or will there be errors, more errors or less errors? So far, we have talked about only one task, generally, uh, reaction time and error only for one task situation. But what happens in the multitask situation? And does the nature of these tasks have any effect on the performance? So what we've already done is that actions take time to perform, which can be measured in the form of reaction time. And that may be a simple reaction time or a choice reaction time, depending upon how many alternatives are available for action. Then uh, several factors influence simple and choice reaction times. And speed accuracy trade-off can be understood in terms of how one affects the other. And what happens in this situation is that if we try to enhance the speed, then more errors may be committed. And therefore, a balance has to be decided in any particular task. So in most situations, the managers may decide that certain level of errors may be allowed so that the tasks can be finished to it with a certain speed. But those errors are within acceptable limits. And generally, those limits are set uh, by the, what, on what system the particular, say, design will be use, used. Then different information processing stages are related to the types of errors that humans commit in task performance. Now, in this session, We'll do things which will help you with the following. Uh, describe multitasking in terms of concurrent and sequential ta task performance. Concurrent means all the tasks are being carried out together. So one of the assumptions is that the tasks don't interfere. They don't interfere at various stages, at the level of perception, uh, decision making. And if they don't have to in interfere with each other at the level of decision making, one of the tasks should be automated, for example, and then at the level of action. And then do actions interfere with our perceptions? So basically, when we want to talk about multitasking, we would like to see how these different stages, are they, uh, are they independent in terms of effect of one on the other? Or there will uh, be an effect of one stage on the other in terms of task interference and its effect on performance. Then list engineering theories of multitasking. We'll not go into the details of engineering theories because focus is more on human performance. So we'll look at psychological theories, uh, which try to explain uh, multitasking in the form of some resources, say attentional cognitive resources, which may be attentional, memory, perceptual, or action. Then explain performance in a multitasking situation in terms of the multiple resource model. So does a single resource model apply when there's a multitasking situation, or even in otherwise, or a multitasking or a multiple resource model is more appropriate. Explain the concepts of time sharing, cost of concurrence, and performance resource function. So what is a task? A task is any goal-oriented activity undertaken by an individual or a group. That's how we define performance. So performance is achievement of that goal, and therefore, performance should be relevant to the particular task that has been taken uh, by the individual or that the individual is performing. In an experimental setting normally, for example, in problem solving and decision making studies, the researcher may set particular objectives. For example, uh, compare two letters in terms of whether they are uppercase, lowercase, whether they have the same name. So in most of the uh, sessions earlier, we have been talking about various types of performance levels 
or performance requirements that are set by the researcher or the experimenter. And these requirements may be there on the systems themselves. And control and manipulate those objectives, stimuli or possible responses, thus changing task parameters to observe behavioral adjustments. So when these task parameters are changed, what behavioral adjustments take place? Do these adjustments take place at the level of perception, at the level of memory, at the level of action selection and implementation where? Now multitasking can take place when someone tries to perform two tasks simultaneously, that is concurrently, both at the same time, or switch from one task to other, so there is a task switching. So either it is a concurrent task condition, a task switching condition, or finally perform two or more tasks in rapid succession, which is called a sequential task condition. And all the three can be found in general life, for example, uh, say driving and uh, conversing on phone. And there can be sequential tasks about which lots of examples are there, say project management, for example. In project management, there will be different stages. So project will be at the stage of formulation. It may be at the stage of data collection. It may be at the stage of analysis, at the stage of writing. Now, sometimes there may be the researcher or the project manager may be shifting between these stages. So it depends. There can be uh, not necessarily all tasks will be on only multitask will be only concurrent or sequential or task. They, most often they may be task switching. So several tasks may be carried out together. And the, for example, the receptionist on a desk uh, uh, converses or welcomes the visitors uh, pick and also attends to the phone calls and also responds to the emails and several other things, looking at letters, responding to the boss's call, giving information to the boss. So several things will go on. And this is also happens in any complex system that we can take an example of. Now, in most often in laboratory studies, and also in general, you know, multitasking involves a dual task condition. So two tasks. Because there is an upper limit with the, the multitask can be handled by an operator or by an individual. So generally, this limit most people suggest is four. Not more than four tasks can be carried out. We, I gave the example of the receptionist on the reception desk of an organization, for example. So those four tasks can be carried out. And they are happening, you know, switching is required. And when switching is required, then attention and memory processes and decision, various things will be affected because of that. So two broad descriptions of multitasking are dual task decrement, that is, when the tasks are carried out either concurrently or in sequential order, there is a task decrement. Generally, in concurrent condition, the decrement will be larger. Decrement means the performance on the two tasks simultaneously or in sequence or in switching will be less as compared to the task on the, in, the performance on the individual task. So when they are carried out together, the performance of both may decline or one may decline or only the other may decline or both may decline. And there is divided attention between tasks. So attention gets divided. And we have already seen the effects of divided attention, what can happen. For example, we may miss certain information, we may misinterpret certain information, and so on. So these are some concepts related to multitasking. Primary task is the priority task. What is a priority? For a driver, for example, driving on the road is a priority task. Conversation is a secondary task. So in case of if heavy demand is put by the traffic on the driver, then driving becomes priority and therefore the conversation will be stopped because the focus is now to be rendered on the situation of the environment, the street situation, how the other traffic is flowing and so on, the density, traffic density and other decisions. Then secondary task is a task that is peripheral to the central or primary task. So conversation is peripheral. Now in various situations where uh, we are driving, for example, and receiving certain inputs uh, from somebody as to where to turn left, turn right, uh, for example, and uh, is there an important landmark, somebody informs us, then both become important. So that is important. But basically, they are both contributing. That is, receiving and interpreting the instructions, the message, and also driving. So both are contributing to the primary task of driving. 
the operator is expected to allocate sufficient mental resources to the primary task to maintain an acceptable level of performance. He or she will then allocate remaining resources to other tasks. So basic idea is that if we can, through training, a lot of experience, automate the primary task, that is what a driver is required to do. For example, how to manipulate the steering wheel, the paddle brakes, and the gear, and so on, how to manipulate all that, how to operate on all that in a manner so that it's almost automatic and no attention is required, et cetera, et cetera. Then sufficient assuming that there's a limited capacity, attentional capacity or cognitive capacity, we have already talked about in the lecture on attention. Then more information or more capacity will be available with the alternative task. Then there is cost of concurrence. I have talked about the cost of concurrence. So these are some examples of multitasking. Observing a traffic pattern and directing aircraft, for example, by the ATS. So air traffic control, people working there, they you know, have to look at various, the, the, the status of various airplanes which are in a particular region, and then look at that pattern. And for a particular pilot, then they have to give appropriate direction as to whether now the pilot can take off or on what particular airstrip the driver should go, etc. Reading a book while eating meal, for example. Uh, driving a vehicle while talking to someone. Working on one project while starting another. So these are the examples of multitasking. What are the potential outcomes due to overload in multitasking? So basically, if there is multitasking, and if the automation does not exist, for example, the automation in performance does not exist, then there will be an overload. And overload means that the cognitive demand of task demand for resources will be more than we can handle the information that is available in the task. Continuing to do everything but less well. So cost of concurrence, for example, will do that. Reducing the number of things being attended to. So eliminate some information. And therefore, the training on what is the relevant information to be eliminated is very much required on systems. The operator cannot eliminate the relevant information because relevant information ignored means wrong goal will be set. So there will be a mistake that will be committed and that can lead to serious outcomes, consequences, safety, and other consequences for the system. Sequencing the task. So arranging the tasks one after the other, dropping everything and walking away. So, you know, now that should be very rare. Nobody can say that, uh, nobody, you know, can be employed to do some work and can say, now I walk off, I don't do this. That is not possible and therefore, that's a very rare, rare alternative and uh, very rarely the operators will resort to that alternative. For some time, they may take off because of the complexity, the whole situation becomes very large. Then there will be momentary shifts and depending on what is the urgency with which the task is to be done, that momentary shape may be very short or slightly more, longer. And then how do we explain all this, the consequences of multitasking? There are some engineering theories and models of multitasking. Now these engineering theories uh, explain an overall human behavior or gross, they describe gross human behavior. They don't go into the mechanisms by which certain uh, decisions are taken or actions are executed, for example, and that, that is done by the psychological theories. So the engineering theories provide estimates of overall human performance. Okay. The examples are queuing theory uh, based models uh, where the operator is considered as a service operator provider and there are various sources of information, for example, displays. They can be considered as customers waiting uh, for the service to be received. So service to be received here would be then the operator has a glance on a particular display or analyzes information on a particular display. So whatever information is picked up from different displays through visual scanning, auditory scanning of eco, for example, then that is uh, the queuing theory. So queuing theory means wait, uh, be in the queue and your turn will come. Control and examination theory based models. Uh, uh, the idea here is to optimize uh, 
the performance and optimal control theory and optimal control models, they are relevant here. Then there are psychological theories and models of uh, multitasking. Uh, psychological theories are concerned with understanding and representing the mechanisms underlying behaviors. So resource theories and models. So basic idea here is that there are some cognitive resources which are allocated for different tasks. And how this allocation takes place depends upon the nature of the task for the complexity, for example, for difficulty level, amount of training, expertise that the operator has. Various things will be there. So one kind of training that is required uh, for operators on the systems is learning this allocation. This is important, you know. Uh, for example, in schools, teachers generally tell students how to allocate time to different questions or different parts of a question. What is more rele relevant, important, where to devote more time in studies, for example, anywhere. Strategic workload management theories and models. Then theories and models of task interruptions. So when a task is performed, some interruption is there. Maybe because of whatever reason. For example, in case of the receptionist, if the boss calls for some information, that may be an interruption when the receptionist is trying to uh, type in some information for an email where a message has to go. Then theories and models of task management and connectionist and neurally based models. We will not discuss all of this. Uh, the focus will be largely on the resource theories. And we will see how, for example, multiple resource theory is very applicable and useful in understanding multitasking and explaining various component processes uh, in that situation. Now, four general mechanisms of human performance can account for variability in multitasking proficiency. So task, we have talked about proficiency while talking about human performance and skill performance primarily. The first is effort or resource demand. So resource demand are related to the difficulty of the task. More difficult the task, more resources are demanded. The similarity between two tasks in task demands for multiple resources. So there's multiplicity. And we'll look at this. The relative priority given to one task over the other resource allocation policy. For example, in driving, driving is the primary task. And therefore, more resources will generally be allocated to that. The similarity between tasks in terms of the specific information and mapping within each task. What is the specific information to be processed? Mechanism one to three are components of multiple resource theory. And we'll uh, go into some detail of the multiple resource theory and see how multiple resource theory can explain effort, similarity, relative priority of tasks. Now, this is a simple model. This is the architect or architecture of uh, multiple resource theory given by Wickens uh, uh, generally and also some of his co-workers. So where uh, these are the uh, three broad components, that is resource demand, multiplicity, and executive control. So resource demand component, which handles mental workload. Mental workload increases with the task difficulty, for example or complexity of the task. And multiplicity component, uh, which depends on the resource structure, whether it's a single resource or there are multiple resources. That is the structure. They determine the total dual task decrement. So first thing is to understand how the total task decrement occurs, and which particular model, for example, uh, whether the single resource model or the multiple resource model and difficulty level of the task, what can go into determining the dual task decrement. And then the executive control, we have talked about executive control to some extent in the uh, attentional theories. Uh, which task suffers more? Is the resource equally divided between the two tasks? So if the resources are equally divided, do they really need equality of division of resources? or do they need different amounts of resources for uh, handling a particular information. Now, let's look at three tasks, A, B, and C. 
A is a difficult task, less practice task and uh, novices may be involved. So, in various forms we define A as a difficult task as it may be absolutely difficult, it may be relatively difficult uh, in terms of experience and training and overuse of a particular information. So, curve A is fully called fully resource limited because in task A the uh, as the, uh, the performance on task A depends upon how much how many resources are allocated to task A and as more resources are allocated performance on A increases and therefore, it is said that it is fully resource limited performance. Lesser the resources, worse will be the performance. So, more difficult task or a task for a less skilled performer will show this kind of relationship between performance and task demand or resource demand and performance may be in terms of speed or accuracy uh, whatever we change. Then curve B is an easier task and therefore, when we are talking about curve B, what we are saying is that at very small level of resources, B will achieve a very high level of performance and then that irrespective of whether we give more resources or not or more resources are allocated to that further does not matter much. There will be very slight increase here and uh, it will become almost asymptotically at a certain level of performance and therefore, this is an easier task involving automaticity and or an, uh, performance by an expert. Finally, the task C is called data limited. That means, up to a certain level, the resource allocation will increase performance, but at when a certain level of resource allocation is reached, performance does not increase any further. That is because the information that we are receiving has limited value or the data in terms of that information is limited. For example, uh, we may receive a very faint signal, auditory signal or it may be very smudged visual information or it may be very fast speech given by somebody in a foreign language that we understand less and so on. So, there after certain level any increased amount of resource allocation will not increase performance. So, there will be resource limited tasks which means that on those tasks as more resources are alloc allocated performance will increase further and there will be task limited or, or, or data limited task where any further increase resource allocation does not do anything to performance and then there will be very easy automatic task performance. So, that is why automaticity is uh, something which is very much to be achieved and that is why experience plays an important role. Then there is some uh, performance resource functions that we can compare to get some more ideas about what happens in multitasking. So, here are two performance resource functions of time shared tasks. So, time sharing happens between the tasks when they are being done concurrently for example. We hear of time sharing in computer processing for example, the CPU or central processing unit uh, time shares between different activities by different users on the multi user uh, system for example. So, here uh, there are two tasks A and B. Now, here A is shown as a decreasing performer because here we have taken the resource allocation in the other direction as compared to here. Here this is uh, low and this is high, but now uh, here it is a comparative resource allocation between the task A and B and uh, therefore, uh, resource allocation to A is increasing in that direction and resource allocation to B is increasing in that direction. And suppose this is the 50 50 resource allocation equally resources are equally allocated to the two tasks. Then this area the shaded area to the right uh, represents a decrement in task A, but not in task B. So, here we can see that task B is performed at a certain level 
uh, in the entire range of resource allocation beyond a certain level. Whereas, for resource A, as more resources are allocated to B, performance on task A decreases and therefore, there is a decrement in A, but not in B. Now, we move over to the left, then we find that there is some point where we may say, okay, that is the minimum requirement that we require on B or maximum requirement. We do not want to really worry about that. Then uh, we can have a resource allocation policy where we say the performance is optimal, acceptable on both the tasks. And when that, ha that happens, then we say there is nearly perfect time sharing. So, what happens in nearly perfect time sharing is that there is an emphasis on A at the expense of B because A seems to be the primary task or maybe more important task or whatever because that, that is uh, resource limited. And therefore, the, the on B also we are getting a high performance. Any resource allocation policy beyond that will lead to either a decrement, performance decrement on A or performance decrement of B. So, that region uh, or that particular point on resource allocation policy where gives a point where uh, we get perfect or nearly perfect time sharing. Now, one can have performance operating characteristic curves. So, characteristic Operating characteristics would mean that we are now looking at performance on the two tasks in terms of performance for both. Here in the performance resource function, we are looking at how performance is related to resource allocation. But here in POC, we are looking at performance on the two tasks. And here we get a very nice idea about the cost of concurrence. So, Norman and Brown provided this idea, suppose we have task 1 and task 2 and we plot performance on task 1 and performance on task 2 in a single space. Then if only task 1 were present, task 2 were not present, then we are likely to get that level of performance. And if only task 2 is present, we are likely to get that level of performance. So, uh, that means, if we are considering two tasks that are data limited, further resource allocation does not improve the performance and individually the task performance will be there. So, we obtain a single point where both and 1 and 2 are, are data limited tasks, we get a single point for the performance. So, on a performance, performance, performance in a performance performance space, we should get uh, some point for performance here. Now, if both the tasks are present, then uh, and if they are both data limited, sorry, performance lim um, resource limited, then what happens is that there will be decline in performance on both the tasks. And uh, he, this is, for example, line where only task 1 is data limited, this is the line when task only task 2 is data limited, this is the point when the two tasks are being concurrently done and both are data limited. But if they are, uh, if one of the tasks is resource limited for example, then we are likely to get a performance which is much lower than the, uh, this point. And that is the cost of concurrence. So, cost of concurrence is the cost that is reflected in the performance level, either in terms of reaction time or in terms of errors, in the performance level of the when the two tasks are carried out concurrently. And this cost of concurrence, uh, one important question can be how can we reduce the cost of concurrence? Because that if most situations will be multitasking situations in many complex systems for pilots, in the uh, air traffic control, ATC uh, performance, quality control, whatever you take, there will be multitasking 
everywhere and therefore cost of concurrence is likely to occur everywhere. So, can training help? Can experience help? Can making one task data limited help? What? How should we proceed? Or is data limited task a solution to various problems? So, these can be important questions. Now, so what happens because of the practice? Because of the practice, suppose the task A is with very little practice, then the performance resource function will be as we have discussed earlier for task A that with increasing resources, the performance on task A increases and that is why it is called resource limited. But if a lot of practice is given, training is given, then because of that, there will be a shift. There will be a shift to a level of performance which will become automatic at some level. So, B, C and D are actually either different tasks with different levels of training or experience. So, as we are moving from A to D, the amount of training on the task is increasing or it may be the improvement in the same task. So, with different levels of training or experience, the POC uh, perform, performance of PRF will move from A to D and that is what will happen. So, it is uh, you know to be understood that experience plays a big role in understanding performance in a multitasking situation. Then there is multiplicity of resources. For example, there may be a dichotomy of stages, there may be processing codes, perceptual modalities, visual channels and a computational model based on these considerations can be developed. So, let us see how the resources get allocated and uh, is there an independence of certain processes in terms of the resource allocation. So, there is no inter interference. Now, multiplicity of resources one simple way to look at is in terms of the dichotomy of stages and broadly speaking in the information processing model, if we recollect the information processing model, we can think of information processing in human beings in terms of two broad categories. One is information reception, manipulation, decision making and the other is action selection and action implementation. So, these are the two broad stages. And it may be shown that the whatever resources are required for cognitive processes do not interfere with what is required on the response related resources. So, these two appear to be dichotomically different resources which are allocated to different stages of information processing. So, cognitive resources cater to say sensory and perceptual processes. And so, basically there is a skeletal representation of the information processing model right from perception to response selection and uh, transmission of information uh, of per from perception from what we see and what we act on, there is working memory that influences that. So, cognitive resources again broadly speaking are the perceptual where information is received interpreted, represented for a, in the form of a percept for example, it is analyzed, interpreted, a meaning is assigned to it based on which then working memory operates on this and the whatever decision is to be taken is taken. So, decision processes are also there. So, perception and working memory uh, they constitute the cognitive resources broadly speaking. Then on the response related resources we have response selection and response execution and this dotted line indicates that these are clearly two different sets of resources. So, there is a dichotomy in terms of uh, these resources for cognitive processes and action related processes. So, there will be some processing codes which will be used at every stage. For example, if we read certain text 
then we have certain codes uh, that are internal. So, cognitive codes for example, the written text, the spoken text, so letter B and the written letter B and capital in, in, in upper case form the capital letter B, they, they all do they all lead to the same understanding and therefore, irrespective of what code we use, it will not change the information. The kind of information that is being provided can be through different channels or different codes and therefore, these uh, understanding these codes can lead to an understanding of how the uh, multiple resource model works for certain kind of information and activities. So, there is analog spatial processing. We have talked about analog and spatial processing earlier. Analog means continuous image based and spatial means any activity in the space and uh, that is happening and uh, that we pick up. Then categorical or symbolic processing, the linguistic or verbal codes. So, either say images, objects and then uh, representation in space for example. So, these are all say location in space for example, visual search for example, we include some kind of uh, both analog and spatial as well as categorical. So, the task can include both and then there will be a parallel processing or serial processing of that code that uh, what we have already discussed somewhere earlier. Then spatial and verbal codes use different resources, they do not interfere. Spatial codes and verbal codes, uh, verbal are more linguistic and therefore, sometimes they make a distinction between the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. So, most of the spatial codes are handled by the right hemisphere, most of the verbal codes are handled by the left hemisphere of the brain and therefore, the resources required may be different etcetera. That is one way to look at how the resource distinction or resource requirement distinction can be made. Then manual for response for example, mouse movement is a manual response. So, receiving information and acting on information and verbal, verbal responses for example, uttering a word or a sentence or saying yes or no processes can be time shared more efficiently. So, if there is a verbal code and there is a manual code, then interference will be minimal and there can they, they will be a good time sharing between the two. Now, what happens in, so at the level of codes that is happening. Then at the level of perception, of perceptual modalities, cross modal time sharing for example, between eye and ear, so audio visual is better than between two auditory channels, audio audio or two visual channels, visual visual. So, because audio and visual codes do not interfere, therefore, at the level of perception also they will use different channels and therefore, time sharing will be much better between these two modalities than if the modalities are the same. Then training on attention allocation strategies is possible, for example, redundant displays in two channels can be used. So, audio visual presentation of certain instructions for example, can be more effective, more useful uh, because one is that the information is being presented in two alternative forms and other is these can be made redundant. So, in redundancy we see that the amount of information that is included is less, relatively less compared to whatever would be there in a single channel, can foster the best of both. So, that uh, you know redundancy can be include redundancy in visual displays for example, and redundancy related to visual and auditory. For example, giving auditory instructions when looking at a visual display. So, in this session we have talked about multitasking and basically what we have seen is that one way to answer multitasking is in terms of whether the tasks are organized in sequence or in parallel what kind of time sharing can be there, how task difficulty or training on the task can influence task performance and then uh, we are trying to look at different processes such as codes, perception and also the uh, so perception modalities and how will they lead to 
the development of a multi-resource model. We will continue with this in the next session. Welcome to this session. In the previous session, we talked about action selection and basically uh, we discussed the measurement of action execution in terms of reaction time, so speed with which an action can be executed. Now in that process, there is some speed accuracy trade-off, which means if we want or if we speed up the action, then uh, we are likely to commit certain errors. Reason defined error as generic term to encompass all those occasions in which a planned sequence of mental or physical activities fails to achieve the intended outcome. And when these failures cannot be attributed to the intervention of some chance agency, basically the idea is that. So it is possible that when wrong goals are set or if the goals are correctly set, then a wrong action is selected and executed or there may be some failures at the level of attention or memory which can lead to these errors. So finally, they will be reflected in performance. Error is a subcategory of unsafe acts. So uh, normally from the perspective of safety, because safety is important in most of the systems, say nuclear plants or any other system that we have, chemical plants. Uh, therefore, safe acts have to be executed. So error is a subcategory of unsafe acts that include slips and lapses that could occur during highly automated or skill-based actions and mistakes related to failures, planning of action. So let us look at uh, how uh, this can be modeled in an information processing way where we have talked about different processes. So what happens at the level of goal setting, memory, perception and decision taking. So unsafe acts include lapses slips and mode errors. Lapses occur because of memory failures, so it's failure to carry out any action at all. So one does not remember what action is to be carried out. Slips are because of attentional failures, carrying out a right intention, appropriate goal was set and therefore the intention was right, but a, an incorrect action is executed. Uh, that may be due to unconscious or forgetfulness. Then mode errors. We may set certain mode of operation for the system and then when we want to, we, when we change, change the mode for next execution of an action, then we forget to do that. For example, normally it happens that we set the caps lock on our system and when we want to type, then the system either reminds us or we know that we have not changed the setting from the caps mode to the normal mode. Unsafe acts where uh, the intended actions uh, are unsafe may be violations. Can be routine or exceptional. Some individuals may contain violations as, an, as a routine or this can be exceptional in some cases. Uh, these, these also include acts of sabotage. So the intention is really wrong and therefore the violation of a rule or a law of a nation say while driving uh, the rules of the driving on the road for example may be violated by some drivers. Then mistakes. Mistakes can be rule based or knowledge based. So we have talked about those different kinds of processes because of which we may commit certain mistakes. The failure to formulate the right intention, forming a wrong goal for example, this is a mistake. So a mistake has been committed. Now mistakes are difficult to detect and normally in our school uh, we were trained for example while learning teachers would say that if something has gone wrong, restart, do it again because finding out exactly where a mistake has been committed, it may be very difficult in complex computations for example and therefore the best idea is to redo the analysis. Now this is a simple model uh, that shows how errors uh, enter into the information processing stages and at what stage. So from the environment, information is received by the sensory processes and we, we feel about that information, we perceive that information from the surrounding environment, maybe in the form of dis displays, in the form of sounds that a running system makes. For example, drivers of vehicles on the road from the noise of the engine, they can uh, really detect immediately that something is going wrong with the system. 
and if they do not do it, then this will carry on and there may be serious problems with the system. Then these are analyzed, this information is analyzed and processed so that a meaning can be assigned to it. Then an evaluation and interpretation is done on the basis of which a goal is set. For example, whether to turn right or move straight or turn left when driving, a goal is set before we reach that particular crossing. And if a wrong goal is set, wrong decision is taken, we may take a long, wrong turn and therefore we commit a mistake. So, mistakes happen at a very early stage and if they are not corrected, then they continue, they have a cascading effect on all other activities that follow that particular decision. Then intention to act, action sequence planning and execution of actions, these are the other stages that follow. So, at the level of intention to act, mental processing of information that leads to intention to act and mental processing influences all three or four earlier four stages that is analysis of information, evaluation, goal setting and intention to act and it also therefore interferes or it also influences the uh, intention to act and how this mental process influences intention to act. The lapses and mode errors, they happen when mental processing is being operated at the level of action sequence and that example with the computer when we type, uh, then we forget to change the mode from upper case to lower case. And normally this happens, you know, if we forget to do that and if you have to open a new software or something, then it may ask for the password and uh, then there may be a nudge. Uh, that comes up on the monitor which says that the caps are on and uh, uh, that will indicate what to do if uh, there is a lapse. Then slips, execution, at the execution level there will be slips. So it is important to understand what kind of errors will happen where because for safety measures these errors should be avoided. Whereas accuracy is related or speed is related to performing an action as required on a system once the goals are set what the system is supposed to do. But for safety measures the errors become very important and therefore uh, when we are talking about safety and security and all that then errors uh, are important. Now this is uh, there is a model uh, which is called the uh, the Swiss cheese model where you know one can look at how the errors percolate, how they move from one place to another if certain steps are not taken at a at an appropriate stage. So uh, there are some latent failures at the managerial level for example, uh, wrong goals may be set, wrong decisions may be take, uh, set, wrong choices of uh, application or methods may be chosen and at the line management level it can happen uh, when a wrong action or wrong system performance is implemented. Then there are some active failures and psychological failures also are there. So these three types of errors, managerial, shop floor or line management and psychological uh, precursors of the errors which may be there. So this is in uh, one group here. Then, uh, then uh, you know these lead to some active uh, failures and these combine to give the overall error. So interactions with local events happen uh, where these errors will be percolated. The basic idea is that the idea is that there are if something happens at one stage. So there are method defenses in, in, at various, in at various steps. Stage. Then finally uh, the loss is that if errors are committed, there will also be there will also be loss. Loss. See, uh, therefore, uh, 
therefore one has to occur in various forms. There may be loss of life in all that becomes important. So, uh, some defense mechanism in quality inspection, there are quality checks comes out is a, is a, an accept and a unit of product which is and then human the basis of the system reliability so now both humans and machines for example include machines, humans and the reliable in what order are they arranged, arranged within a parallel order order and according depend upon the reliability of that individual. Then level is the product of the reliabilities of individuals. Some failure will be 1 minus the reliability of the reliability of the system. The system failure, system failure on the basis of really a failure of each component which is 1 minus the in this case when the components are connected in parallel in parallel RP of failure of the suppose you have two components in a system and and they have respect uh, that means the failure the failure probability is two then using the above formula 0 0.72 uh, 0.9 into 0 0.9 into 0.8 or to those two elements in the uh, when the if these two components components with reliabilities are 0 0.9 0 0.8 then the probability of system failure will be parallel then the probability and the probability of system are connected in series and the reliability the reliability of the system will series connect how the organization of because uh, when they are connected in series in series one sub so uh, just execution response to a stimulus is generally the response is executed or uh, select, uh, selected action component processes and we can also quantify speed accuracy trade off is useful in is useful in determining the uh, human errors are human errors are related to in a human being in a system all organizational performance and accidents may be possible. Now, the to further understand whatever has been discussed, has been discussed. Is, uh, this focused on uh, this focused on selection of session included uh, the action selection. Action selection speed, etc. In task was considered. Review the concept more than uh, one action to be one after the other, and if one after and if one after the other action can be done. And so, for example, in the sensory modality modality if we 
treated. If it's a foveal region, they not allow new information to be picked up. So it where next next incoming gap between the readiness of the refractory period. And the refractory period is there in period is there in cognitive everywhere. So this refractory within what inter stimulus inter stimulus interval and so serial response is how can the gap between machine and human reliability basically we have considered a very simple example of two components and computing reliability etc but that is in case of the system how do we get to human reliability so this particular article by swan uh, and the related literature to describe the technique of human error rate prediction is there and uh, you should look at that literature and understand how that human reliability can be understood. Develop a framework for error remedies in an organizational context. We have not discussed what remedies are possible if the errors are committed. And again, a review of reason 1990, 2008, and 2020 will be useful in this direction. So these are some references which can be used to further explicate the ideas and they provide the information that we have used in this particular lecture. Thank you very much.